Good morning again. And you know, it is just such an honor and a gift to be able to preach on Sunday mornings. But it truly takes a village to plan and lead worship week in and week out. And so we express our gratitude for all of those who behind the scenes do so much to prepare for worship, including our office staff and our custodial staff and our live stream ministry and our faithful deacons. And again, a special thank you to Cynthia and Diane for providing the special music this morning. Would you please pray with me? O oh, ever-present and ever-near God, come to us now and touch our hearts and move our spirits through your word for us this day. And, oh, dear God, may the words that I have to offer here this morning please you and honor you and glorify your holy, holy name. In Jesus' sweet name we pray, amen. Amen. I'd like to begin this morning by posing some questions to all of you for your consideration. And so I ask you this question. How many of you create daily or perhaps weekly checklists or written reminders or to-do lists? Anyone? <laughs> yes, yes. You know, those, those household or job-related tasks that you must complete, or those phone calls that you absolutely must make, or those work or church meetings that you must attend, or those other appointments and commitments that you must make and keep. I realize that all of us, no matter our various and respective roles, no matter the stage or season of our lives, all of us have a lot to keep track of in our day-to-day -day routines. And I'm also aware that these days, there are numerous ways to be reminded of our daily schedules and commitments. And just as important, there are also different ways to be reminded to take a break and rest. Perhaps you or someone that you know sets reminders on your cell phone. Yes, anybody do that? <laughs> Or maybe you use a web-based app like Calendly or Google Calendar. Or maybe you write your appointments on the wall calendar and have that there in the kitchen where you can see it every day and be reminded. Or maybe you create a checklist in your daily planner. Or Maybe you are a sticky note user or a post-it note queen like me. <laughs> or it may be that you use a number of these different approaches to organize your days and honor your commitments. At home, I am known to even stick post-it notes on our large family desk blotter calendar that we keep on the kitchen counter. And I also use my UCC desk calendar quite a bit as well. Now, no matter how we prioritize and keep track of our commitments, it is important, of course, that we do so. In fact, I have come to see this organizing task as yet another spiritual practice or an intentional routine that not only gives shape and meaning to our days and our weeks and our lives, but such a practice also helps us to establish and maintain healthy 
boundaries. By being realistic and clear in identifying our priorities, while also being discerning about what it is that we must put on hold for the time being and or what activities or commitments that we need to finally set down for good. Our gospel reading from Mark this morning may be familiar to you. It is a lectionary reading that we return to in worship every three years. And one of the themes of this reading that often emerges for preachers and worshipers alike is the need that all of us have at times. That is the need to retreat and to rest and to reset and to recharge in our personal lives as well as in the ministry that we share and that we are called to do together as the church and as followers of Jesus Christ. However, our text this morning also reminds us that it is not always that easy or simple or practical to find the time to create the sacred space in our lives that each one of us needs for holy rest and reflection and prayer. Now, at the beginning of this pericope, we catch a glimpse of the disciples gathering around Jesus and sharing with him the stories about what I imagine were the joys and the concerns of their ministry among the crowds, as well as their personal experiences of offering healing and hope to the people. And we also acknowledge that often for the disciples, gathering around Jesus was an opportunity to discuss with him the challenges and the obstacles and the anxiety that they surely experienced at times in the ministry that Jesus called them to do wherever Jesus led them. However, in this particular scene, it wasn't even possible for Jesus and his disciples to have an uninterrupted conversation because the needs of the people were so overwhelming and the crowds surrounded them. And we see the people gathering around Jesus, desperate to receive Jesus' healing touch and experience his healing presence. And then Jesus, being the compassionate and responsive and adaptive leader that he was, insisted that the disciples and he set out right away in order to find the time and the space to rest and to set some of those boundaries around their ministry. Not to evangelize, not to teach, not to preach, not to heal, not to serve, but to retreat and to rest together. The biblical Greek word for rest in this story is anapases. Anapases, which literally means to pause and to rest. And so in this profound and pivotal moment early on in their shared ministry, Jesus doesn't suggest to the disciples that they all go off and find a quiet place to take a 20-minute power nap. Rather, Jesus commands the disciples to practice anopsis. He commands them to pause and set some boundaries so that they would find rest. And so they 
attempted to do so. Jesus and the disciples headed off to what was supposed to be a quiet place, a place to rest their bodies, a place to refresh their spirits, and a place to restore their strength. Now, Jesus and his disciples traveled there by boat to what was believed to have been a deserted place at that time. However, it turns out that they didn't have any time whatsoever to be alone and to rest because the crowds of people caught up with them there as well. And what were the people doing? The people of God were gathering around Jesus because they were desperate for inspiration. They were desperate for guidance and direction and for healing in their lives. How then did Jesus respond to them? Jesus met the people exactly where they were and in all of their need. And so it was there, in that remote place, that Jesus began to teach and inspire and encourage the crowds among them. And then again, later on in this story, we encounter a similar situation. But this time, Jesus and his disciples had made it to Gennesaret, the small plain bordering the west shore of the Sea of Galilee between Capernaum and Magdala. But once again, the crowds of people rushed to seek Jesus out in that region, bringing to him all who were sick and in need of healing. This time, it was the people of Gennesaret who were also gathering around Jesus, that they would receive hope and healing and new life. Now, I don't know about you, but I find our text from Mark for today to be a bit challenging to follow because there are these multiple scenes and settings in this story and many different crowds and countless individuals who presented to Jesus with needs for healing and wholeness. Through this writing in this sixth chapter, the Gospel writer of Mark certainly depicts a time of high anxiety and stress and despair and even chaos, as well as the deep need among the people for healing and wholeness and grace. It was indeed a time of high anxiety and stress and despair and chaos. Hmm. Does that sound familiar to any of you? Can you relate as you try to make sense of the current state of affairs across our nation just this past week? including an attempted assassination of the former president, resulting in the tragic loss of life of two individuals. And all of that, of course, is on top of an especially acrimonious political climate across our country including the sharp divisions and bitter rhetoric so far in this cycle of the presidential campaigns and national conventions. Oh, my goodness. As we move forward as a nation and deeper I'm afraid, into the partisan politics that come with this consequential presidential election year, may we all find inspiration and direction as we gather around Jesus together. 
And may we find grounding through our shared faith and values, as well as our commitments and our priorities. And may we find meaning and purpose and hope through our shared ministries and through our witness as the church in the world today. I'd like to close with a brief prayer that was written just this past week in response to the events of late by the Reverend Dr. Diana Butler Bass, who is a progressive theologian and an award-winning author. Let us pray. O oh God, who is beyond politics and nations, O oh Christ, who, is, who transcends the power of violence, and O oh Holy Spirit, who animates all people, be with us now in this time of violence and division and turmoil. We ask, O oh God, that you would transform our anger and our pain, that we might see our sisters and brothers with your eyes and break our hearts of stone and give us hearts of love and understanding that your peace might prevail. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.